everything that lives is designed to end. People complain about the amount of ports that we see on the Nintendo Switch, but when it's a series I've never experienced and that's so highly praised, it's quite delightful, especially when they're presented in this manner. A massive thanks to Square Enix UK for the review copy, come in from the masterminds over at Platinum Games, and a spin-off of the Drakengard series. It saw its debut release in Japan in February of 2017. I'm asking myself if these androids dream of electric sheep, but on Switch, is there enough RAM? Well, let's find out. Firstly, you're going to want to know if you need to have played the previous games in the Nier series, and the answer is no. You don't need to, but it will certainly benefit you if you have. Here's a brief rundown. All of humanity has left the Earth and headed for the Moon for safety. Why have they done this? Well, the Earth has been overrun by aliens who created a machine race which has overrun the planet. In a bid to once again reclaim the Earth, the humans have created androids, which they send down with the sole task of eradicating the machines as well as the aliens. You play as 2B. You're a part of the latest group of androids from the Your Herd division. You're a combat model android joined by a scanner unit known as 9S. The androids you play as seem to exhibit most human emotions, although it's alluded to quite early that androids are banned from experiencing them. It's quite an interesting take on the post-apocalypse genre, seeing the protagonists, themselves part machine, beginning to question the emotions that they're seeing displayed in some of the machines they're having to fight. It certainly raises some interesting questions about consciousness and at what stage the imitation of human life crosses over into life itself. It's all set to the backdrop of 11,945 AD with the Earth's broken carcass beginning to sprout forth with new life, literally and metaphorically. As a new player to the series, it's impressive how quickly large swathes of story are delivered to the player without becoming confusing, and perhaps more impressively without you sitting through hours and hours of cutscenes. Much of the narrative simply takes place through conversations, and for those wishing to go a bit deeper, you'll find much more within the side quest content. Comically, the developers said they were inspired by the side quests of The Witcher 3, and that they could never live up to that but that was their goal. And yeah, they haven't lived up to that, but these are relatively interesting side quests for the most part, having a touch of heart to them. It's beneficial to know right from the outset that there are a ridiculous number of possible endings, but also some playthroughs will experience entirely different story arc moments, such as one beginning with a full-scale invasion. It's very clever and gives a real reason to play through again. Near Automata then is an action RPG, and it showcases just why Platinum Games really are the best at making action titles. The combat is exceptionally good. It's fast-paced and allows you to switch between two main weapons. You can customize the way these are laid out and also upgrade them with components that you gather from the slain enemies. As well as this, you'll have an automatic turret which follows you around, and this can also be upgraded. When enemies attack, you can dodge out the way at the last minute to get a slowdown, or if you move in their direction, you can perform a parry, the latter of which is slightly more difficult and evasion seems a much easier tactic. Unusually, Near Automata also features aerial combat. Although these sections are used to a lesser degree, they're equally polished, at times playing out like a bullet hell shooter and at others a classic twin stick. What was impressive was how quickly it switched from one to the other. It's an experience which never lets the player become complacent and just when you might, well, it'll introduce a larger enemy. There are some incredible boss fights as well as mini bosses, and there are a hundred touches to tailor the experience. Things like being able to change the AI of your partner, make them more aggressive or more passive, or use all the gathered components to craft weapon upgrades or modules which you can insert into your character, allowing you to change your skill set or get stronger in a particular area. There is standard leveling here which increases your health as well as other attributes, but Automata embraces the idea of you as an android with modular components needing to be installed. And more space becoming available as you advance. Other than combat, there's the exploratory elements, a huge open world with several different biomes. You're free to travel wherever you want, and for the first six hours or so, you'll be doing a heck of a lot of running. Or you might just tame a moose and ride that instead. Yeah, I didn't expect that either. It's full of surprises. There's a fishing game in here as well, and the locations really shine. You'll visit some incredibly unusual, almost magical places. 
and Nier likes to switch up its perspective. Sometimes the camera will shift and it may see you fighting from a top down view, or it will pan out to the side and have you doing some 2D platform jumping. 2B is quite the athlete, and while she's sprinting from building to building, she can also leap off and grab hold of her android and use it to slowly sail down to the ground. There's a fluidity of movement that's bolstered by some incredibly impressive animation. Thankfully, there's a fast travel system that's introduced, albeit a little too late for my liking. After about six hours, you unlock the ability to fast travel, and this can be done from any of the access points. It also plays on the interesting idea that you're not actually traveling anywhere, simply your consciousness is being passed on to another replica version of yourself. Undoubtedly, as you progress in the game, you'll come across an enemy that you simply can't defeat. Death in Nier Automata is a little punishing, particularly if it happens before you've unlocked fast travel. It sees you having to return to your corpse to regain your lost items. Not necessarily all of them, but you will want to return. Now, if you die a second time, then that initial corpse will be lost forever. And I know that because it happened to me on a number of occasions. Sometimes with an open world action RPG, so many of the mechanics can seem familiar. It's actually a combination of many smaller details which make it stand out. That's certainly the case here. Take leveling up your weapon. Each time you level up, it actually unlocks a different part of its history. Yep, there's a full story attached to each weapon. Such a small and potentially pointless little detail that I found really intriguing. Then there are the moments where you can see that Platinum Games are just having fun, like fighting on the back of a moving roller coaster, or throwing in a hacking game during a boss battle. There's also a great balance between the frenetic pace of combat and the slower relaxing moments between it, where believe it or not, you can actually go fishing. One challenge of any open world game is to create confines without the feeling of being confined. Unfortunately, at times with Nier, there are invisible walls that are very overt. There may be a doorway that one time you could travel through and another you simply hit this invisible wall. It happens more often than I would have liked and is a little immersion breaking when it does. Unusually, they've also included some motion controls. These allow you to swing the Joy-Cons around to do light and heavy attacks and I disabled them after a around about three seconds. They didn't add anything to my experience. Nice to see them here, but essentially pointless. For any fans of open world action RPGs, Nier Automata is a game you will love. I was hugely impressed by the gigantic kaiju, the ever-changing ebb and flow of the game, and the excellent narrative that was incredibly easy to pick up and understand. It's presented beautifully on Switch and will happily sit alongside The Witcher and Zelda as one of the best open world titles on the platform. Gameplay score 19 out of 20 and controls also score 19 out of 20. As far as artistic design goes, I'm really impressed. The Goliaths look incredible, and they have that unnerving aspect that you find in the giants of Attack on Titan. There's just something strange about them, from the groans they make to those glowing red eyes. The character design across the board is exceptional, but Platinum Games have to be credited for their animations. Just check out the walking animation of the main character. She doesn't simply come to an abrupt halt. She takes a few really natural steps. It's really subtle, but it makes it look natural. The resolution's good, but potentially uses some dynamic resolution scaling, and it's targeting 30 frames per second in both docked and handheld. This is maintained very well in the earlier game, although there are a few areas like the Forest Kingdom, which cause the Switch to struggle a bit. One of the chief artists, Akihiko Yoshida, is very well known for his work on the Final Fantasy series. He designed Van from Final Fantasy XII, and there's certainly some artistic crossover here. In handheld, everything's running just as well, and text size is legible, but thankfully most characters are voice acted in the main storyline. The soundtrack is fantastic. With the lead composer from Nier and Drakengard 3, Kaichi Okabe, expertly balancing his melancholic style with some really quite catchy and upbeat songs from some of the areas. The characters and their models are indeed impressive. Some of the world environments look a little flat. This is mainly down to the texture resolution being a little bit low, but their overall impact is still quite impressive. There are ripples in the sand when you slide down dunes, and the Disneyland-inspired carnival with party streamers and dancing robots is both delightful and terrifying in equal measure. Visuals and performance combined, they score 16 out of 20. Audio scores 19 out of 20.
Near Automata, the end of Yora edition, will set you back £34.99 or your regional equivalent on the Nintendo Switch eShop. For comparison, it's £29.99 on Steam, but that's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. In fact, for that price, if you're new to the series like myself, it presents much better value than many of the games I've picked up at the full £49.99 you'd usually expect. Included in that price, you'll get three different types of Colosseum and three types of costume based on characters from Near Replicant. They're obtained through Quest Rewards. For action RPG fans, this is an essential purchase. Performance is good on the Switch, impressively so at times, and the storyline is brilliant. There are numerous endings to work through, and there's a ton of side content. You could happily put 60 to 100 hours in, although to see your first credits, you're looking at about 20. Value's right up there. It scores 19 out of 20. Well, this is an experience that plays brilliantly in handheld, and it's nice to be able to sit here and tell you that the developers have clearly put the effort in. Yes, there are a couple of quirks with performance in some later game areas, but nothing that can't be tweaked with a patch. Overall, it's very impressive. It gets a switch up score of 92%. Is this one you'll be picking up? I strongly recommend it, it's brilliant. Thanks to all of you that enjoy the content. Do let me down know down in the comments what you thought of it. And as always, if you wanna save 10% on this price, so what would that be, like £3.50, then use code SWITCHUP to buy your eShop credit over at switchup.gg and we get a tiny little kickback from Nintendo that's all official and above board, unlike some of the key sites. Thanks to our Patreons for supporting us each and every month, we really appreciate it. And as always, for all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers guys! See ya!